Hello, everyone. Today I'm with Dr. Ashok Beatty, and uh, Dr. Beatty is a diplomat union analyst and a board certified psychiatrist. He's a member of the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Great Britain and a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Uh, he is interested in the emerging frontiers of spirituality and healing and the synapses of mind, body, soul, and spirit. He's the author of Path of the Soul, Awaken the Slumbering Goddess, and uh, co-author of, what is it? How to Retire Your Family Karma. So welcome, Asha. Thank you, John. It's delightful to be with you down there in Australia, one of my favorite places in the world. And uh, my own story about how I even got into Jung, uh, it may be helpful to sort of give you a context in how I started to get to this alchemy, this soup. Yeah. I was, of course, born in India. I was born in a devout Hindu family. My biggest teacher was my grandmother, who would tell me all these interesting stories. And I was lost problems with girlfriends or problems with school or someone. I'd consult her and she wouldn't give me a straight answer, but she'd tell me a story. <laughs> and, yeah. and usually it had to do about, you know, stories of India and our past and gods and goddesses or whatever. And somehow it always had embedded in that story the answer to my problem. And so I learned intuitively to listen to her stories very carefully because in there was a prescription, which I just, uh, you know, found most helpful. Uh, and so that became my interest in, Eastern mythologies and stories and, and so forth. Then, of course, as if I would have it, I was raised by Jesuits through all the way from kindergarten to pre-medical college. Uh, and uh, so at home, I was a devout Hindu. And uh, at my school, I was embedded in a very Christian, Catholic, Jesuit matrix. Uh, and on one hand, it was confusing. But on the other hand, it was very enriching. I started to make connections between these different frameworks uh, and sort of gave me a three-dimensional view uh, of the whole process of the psyche and the culture and so forth. And then, of course, I moved on, did my medical school, went to England, get, got my psychiatric training. And, uh, uh, and, and, and this was in, in, in Ahmedabad? Asha? Uh, the medical schooling was in Ahmedabad, in BJ Medical College, very old well-established medical school, over 100 years old. Yeah. And uh, then in England, I did my psychiatric training in a number of centers, including at the end, my primary training was at the Oxford Regional Hospital Board uh, in, in England. And uh, uh, in that training, it was mainly medical psychiatry in those days. And uh, uh, new drugs were coming up, so people were all seduced by you know the psychopharmacological revolution, which continues to do to this day. If you look at a American Journal of Psychiatry, the latest thing is the newest drug, the newest technique, the ketamine th therapy, the psychedelic therapy, the new sexy drugs, and all that. Mm. Uh, however, what I found was all these drugs put the fire out. Patient feels better, but they keep coming back for you know the relapse they keep coming back with some other problem uh, so uh, it is like a shape shifter the symptoms go away but new symptoms emerge and at the bottom of it patient is still very unhappy so you know there is no joy there's no engagement there's no vitality there is no flow uh, they, they become sort of adapted to the outer life somehow get by the criteria for mental health restoration is are you able to go back to your work, take care of yourself, and stay out of trouble? And those are the three main criteria. Yeah. That is not an optimal mental health. Mm -hmm. Optimal mental health is about vitality, about relatedness, about uh, you know following your bliss, as uh, Joseph Campbell would say, about you know looking for some higher purpose. None of that is a goal of traditional psychiatry. H so H to human flourishing. Uh, in a way, oh, and flourishing, not only surviving, but flourishing and, yeah. and and blossoming beyond survival. So then I said, well, there must be a deeper answer. So clearly, then I turned to Freud because in my training in England, Freud was hot at that time. 
And um, and uh, it was intriguing. It was very helpful. I, I still admire Freud and his approach. But at the end of it all, the central theme of Freudian work is repressed sexuality, repressed desire, and a sort of a uh, oblique and a uh, uh, indirect fulfillment of that wish through a symptom or some kind of a neurotic adaptation. And when you resolve it, then your neurosis become regular misery of life. So that was the best outcome is that you're not neurotic, you're just miserable because life is like that. Uh, and, uh, and your sexuality or whatever can never be consummated. You can't sleep with your mother. I mean, that, uh, you know, as simple as that. Mm. So uh, so then I said, well, that sounds good, but the problem to the intricacy of human condition can't just be repressed sexuality. There's got to be, you know, rest of the story. No, and uh, and especially in, in relation to your grounding with your grandmother's spirituality and her yes. spiritual stories. Yeah, I was looking for a story that will explain the problem, and there was no story in in Freudian lexicon that will make sense. There are no stories. Basically, it's just about you know what was your childhood like, and that's very important, of course. But there has to be more to one's life than childhood. What about your past life as an Indian? I said, well, I can go to childhood, but what about you know my many other lives as a Hindu? I could not forget that we have lived many times, and we'll live many more lives probably. So. Uh, those ideas were all echoing, and I, so I had to look beyond uh, Freud. But I did not have any framework for that. I had heard about Jung in my training in England, and there was one page which was disparaging of Jung. He said, well, he was an esoteric guy who talked about collective unconscious and archetype and has limited relevance to clinical problems. That is what I had learned. So I said, well, I can't go there. But a series of synchronistic events uh, reintroduced me to Jung, and uh, and then I, uh, a colleague's wife uh, gifted me a book as they were leaving to move to some other town on Jung's anthology on dreams, which I was not very excited about initially, but one uh, cold winter afternoon in Milwaukee, it was a snowstorm, I was sitting by the fireplace, nothing to read, so I picked up that book, and I was hooked on Jung, and then I became a Jungian analyst. Uh, now, I, my my troubles were still not over, John, because in Young Institutes, the whole emphasis was on Christian centric, Eurocentric, uh, you know, Greek mythologies and so forth, and it's all very good stuff and uh, much of much value. But it still didn't jive with my grandmother's stories. I was trying to reconcile that. So one of my mentors said, "Well." don't get in trouble about, about your views. Why don't you journal all your ideas about how you understand Jung from East and, and then see what, you know, keep that in a separate kind of vessel, which is, was a great advice. And uh, a few months after I became a Jungian analyst, a publisher picked up that book. They loved it. And, and that was my first book, Part of the Soul. Yeah. It's an Eastern understanding of individuation process and this whole Jungian map. And then uh, I didn't choose to, but sort of it chose me to kind of keep deepening that thought. And that became a series of books and uh, ideas about integration of East and West. Just as a matter of interest, Ashok, you know, there are so many myths in India, right? So many stories. Yes. Do you have one or two favorite, favorites? Uh, uh, you know, for yourself, personally, I'm saying, you know, yeah. I'm thinking of when Jung said, you know, what is your myth? What, um, uh, what are the myths you relate to most? Can you just write right. something about it? <laughs> well, actually, I could give you two, because <laughs> there's two stories that have a big impact on, on my own process. Mm. And, and one was, before I, before I became a Jungian analyst, I was in Jungian analysis, but had not yet decided if I want to, to get into it full speed. And uh, at that time, I was a clinical director of a private psychiatric hospital here in town, and it was a power trip for an immigrant psychiatrist from India to be a chief of you know, a program. And mm. there were three, 400 <clears throat> staff members. There were 60 psychiatrists that I would you know, kind of guide. So it was a heady trip and, uh, and so forth. Uh, but then it lost its luster after a while because it was management and insurance companies. And I said, 
I, I don't really I, care. Yeah. So I sort of voluntarily gave up that uh, that job. Uh, it was not a full time job. But I did that as a you know part of my my process. I kept up with patients. I always love to work with patients. <clears throat> so I wanted to return to full time patient care because that's where I really I feel good and alive. And uh, so, but I was missing the power. I was missing the you know the you know the the energy of being in a power position, uh, and was feeling a little bit exiled. So I had a dream. And in my dream, I was back in my hometown uh, in Ahmedabad. That's the town where Mahatma Gandhi has his ashram. My home was actually just a you know, 15 minute bike ride from there. Mm. I, on my way to my school, I would go through that ashram every morning. And uh, so in this dream, I was back in my hometown but in my college, St. Xavier's College, it's a Jesuit college in my hometown, it's still there. And uh, and I was visiting my three mentor Jesuit fathers, Father Wallace, Father Rotega, Father De Souza, three of my favorite father uh, Jesuit teachers. And we were at the college cafeteria, a tropical place, so it was outdoor in the garden. And we were sitting across a, a, a table and we were having our coffee and sandwich or tea. In India, we have tea. Now we have coffee. So we had tea and sandwich. And after that, Father Wallace and I go to the to the chapel in the in the college. And I pray to, you know, to Krishna. He prays to Christ. And we, you know, and that was the end of the dream. And I said, Why, well, what's this dream all about? And it emerged that the dream was that I was feeling alone and exiled all the way in America, away from my country, away from India, away even from England, where I had so many friends, just out here in the, you know in a cold, sort of boonies kind of place. <laughs> I feel big, was feeling sorry for myself. And my initial thought was, in my dark hour, my three Jesuit mentors, fathers that come to reassure me that I may be alone and exiled. I may be alive, uh, exiled, but I'm not alone. They are with me spiritually. So it was a very reassuring feeling that I you know, my mentors have constellated in my psyche to love me, support me, guide me, that will still guide you. And so that stream stayed with me for a long time. And uh, and then it kept coming back, not the dream, but the memory of the dream. So two years down the line, I was now in the Jungian training and this dream kept popping up. I talked to, you know, my mentors, my analyst about it. And then it emerged that it was not just my three mentor fathers, but the very Holy Trinity of the Christian tradition had showed up, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, they had come to bless me and guide me. And that was very, very reassuring that I had the blessing of the, of the Holy Trinity. Uh, and, and that kept me going for two, three years. And then it still came back uh, as an unresolved puzzle. So I said, what's that all about? And then it emerged to me, I had just come back from Mumbai, and I'd visited Elephanta Caves, where you might remember there are a lot of statues, one of the Hindu trinity, the, the Shiva, the destroyer, Vishnu, the preserver, and Brahma, the creator. Uh, so I said, well, not only did my three mentor father Jesuit show up, they brought with them the three highest God energies, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you know, hopping on, uh, on top of that were my three great tradition uh, fathers, you know, the, the Shiva, Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesha. So I said, wow, that, that's cool. I mean, I got this whole archetypal energy uh, enveloping and, 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 and creating an archetypal safety bubble for me. And that stayed for two, three years. And, and then uh, a series of events indicated there was more to the story. It was, I won't waste your time in telling you, well, a friend of mine in India said, well, you have a lot of God statues in your house. Where, where are the goddesses? And there was a big omission on my part. And I, I then I connected. These three gods, Shiva, Brahma, and Vishnu, cannot do any work without the support of their energy, with the Shakti. So Brahma cannot create without help of Saraswati. That is the vessel for his work. Vishnu cannot do what he's doing without help of Lakshmi, his his consort, and uh, and Shiva would keep on destroying unless he was tamped down by Parvati or Shakti. 
So these three gods needed this uh, anima counterparts to really do their work, to execute their archetypal intent. So then I researched and wrote a book, Awaken the Slumbering Goddess, mm -hmm. about the energies behind the gods. And that became the next level of engagement. And so that kind of journey has continued. It continues to unfold. And that one dream became sort of a spine, an archetypal spine of that creative process, which continues to this date. Then I learned in neuroscience that we have three brains. We have uh, Paul McLean in, in Canada did research. We got a Nobel Prize for that on triune brain, three brains. We all have three brains. Mm -hmm. Reptilian brain, survival brain, autonomic nervous system. Then we have what we call the limbic brain, the limbic system, which is archetypal brain. It has the ancestral memory going back 2 million years, as Anthony Stevens' book, The Two Million Year Old Self, which is now supported by genomic research. Yeah. Dr. Francis Collins is, is a genomic guru in America. He was the, uh, the chief of National Institute of Health and the chief of Dr. Fauci's boss. He was the one who was a co decoder of the human genome. And he's written this beautiful book, The Seek the Language of God, which is DNA. So uh, it's a wonderful book, by the way, if anyone wants to get a little glimpse into the wonder of archetypal storehouse, that is our genome. And the genome in the limbic system is where we have the archetypal ancestral memory, which we can access through our dreams and synchronistic events and imagination. So that's our limbic brain, which is the focus of Jungian work. That's the place, go-to place for us as youngins, that will be a place where James Hillman would go, you know, where is that limbic response? That is a neuroscientific place. And then, of course, and, on top uh, of our, his, his limbic brain takes him back to Greece quite a lot. Whereas it seems, in my limbic brain. It, goes it, to seems, <laughs> it seems that yours goes very much back to your ancestral spirits. Or exactly. Maybe, um, Absolutely. And each one of us has our own limbic portal, you see. So I, I think when I was in Australia, I was doing a presentation to a group in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had some very fancy presentation and PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. And I got uh, distracted by the Glass House Mountain uh, near Brisbane. Yeah. Uh, so my host, Susan uh, and James, you probably know them. I, I know you know Susan. Uh, they were a host, and I asked them, what is this mountain? What's the story? And then I recognized that that is the story of the myth of the Australians, the whole continent. And, and we discussed it. I, I scrapped my presentation, and I invited the group to unpack with me the, the myth of the Glasshouse Mountain. And it's a myth of an orphan in exile, which is a story of the Amer of Australian psyche, for example. So you have your own limbic con you know, contacts, context and your own limbic resonance. Every culture has a limbic portal. Yeah. And I think we live a very limited life mm. if we don't access the wisdom of that limbic depth. So I, I think that's the beauty of Jungian work. And, Ab and so absolutely, forth. absolutely. And I remember Hillman said once towards the end of his life that... Uh -huh. uh, Jung opened the 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 mouth of the dead or something like that. Right. That 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 uh -huh. Jung opened up this world um, of of the dead, and I uh -huh. think that's so true. It's what you're just saying, yeah. really. Absolutely, and not only for us as Jungians, but for each one of us, we can access you know that portal if we pay attention to our dreams, our synchronistic events, to our daydreams, you know, to to something that catches you, uh, you know, that fascination is not random. It is, uh, you know, catches you. I will, uh, maybe I'll talk about, you know, the project that my colleague and I did during the COVID epidemic, which was my book, uh, Staying Centered uh, in an Eye of the Storm, was how to manage COVID pandemic for, for individuals here. So, so I think that's the limbic brain. And then, of course, our third brain is our... Uh, neocortical brain, this new stuff that is about willpower, discernment, and so forth, uh, which is a very recent acquisition, 200,000 years or so. So mm. each one of us, so there is a trinity in our psyche, in the brain, mm. and optimal mental health comes from integrating all three. The, the new psychiatry and psychology only deals with neocortical stuff. 
mm-hmm. cognitive approach you know be rational don't be irrational the cognitive therapy which i love is helpful but does not go deep enough it mm-hmm. talks about you have you know catalog your irrational thoughts challenge them and replace them with rational thoughts that's the cognitive therapy elegant but does not go deep because there is no limbic because what is the source of the irrational thoughts the source of irrational thoughts is misalignment with your archetype and i think that is or, or a call of the archetypes what seems irrational may be very rational in the unconscious so i think unless we deal with irrationality with the esoteric stuff in our consciousness we cannot be whole and that esoteric stuff which is outside of the neocortical brain in the limbic brain and we also want to pay attention to your autonomic survival reptilian brain because without survival there is no archetypes and there is no discernment so the whole of yoga tradition and and so forth that deals with the the reptilian brain and centering that aligning it with the archetypes and then making a sort of a cortical choice neocortical choice about your life so a optimal approach would put the whole trinity of human consciousness and human neuro psyche neuro psychology neuro structures into play and when they dance together to the symphony of the self the soul then we become whole then we become aligned with the will of the universe and that that is what unas mundas is when we are aligned and that is what moksha is in hindu tradition moksha is when your atman consciousness is aligned with the brahman that is the whole idea of the advaitya vedanta tradition incidentally on a, on a side note the whole idea of the advaitya un, undivided non dualistic consciousness meaning you and i and the world are one we are connected to the source only differences in our surface currents deep we are all interconnected like all the oceans so i, I think one of the things is as you you know as you're talking there is you know is how to draw together the language uh because in the west that might be the anima mundi isn't it like the soul of the world or the yeah world uh, soul the brahman end, yeah and in in the east it would be brahman yeah yeah so so i i think uh, you know they the, that is where young now the the the, the whole uh, dynamic here is young was deeply influenced by the hindu and indian thought uh, he had a big collection of uh, the upanishadic literature and the Yeah, wisdom books of the East by Max Muller and others, and he was very well read on these matters more than the average Indian scholar in his days. So that was quite a feat. He was well known, versed with the Vedic tradition and the Samkhya tradition, and the uh, and the Patanjali he did lectures on that in Zurich after he returned from India. So I think he was into it, but young Indians have not quite. consciously acknowledge and integrated that when they do that will they will be blessed with a much deeper insight and and a much more vibrant uh, sort of anima mundi experience as such so but those are that's work in progress do you think um oh what am i trying to say i can remember in the 60s right there were um there was an interest in uh you know all of a sudden there was an interest in east west an interest in 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 hindu hinduism and an interest in jung um yes and those things started to come and then the beatles went to india so there was this interest right and a lot of people started to travel to the east and then you know jung has written about it but do you think that he got things wrong even though he was you know opening us to the east a little Do you think that some of his he was perhaps a little you know eurocentric in the way he looked at it sometimes? Well I think he was eurocentric and I think rightfully so if he had gotten to court in uh, Hindu and eastern uh, sort of spiritual thought he probably we would not have analytical psychology we probably have a very good scholar in East, eastern mythology so I'm glad he stayed with his own process and uh, and now we can use the the uh, the portals he established to access even the wisdom of the east the gold mine so he did not discover the gold necessarily but he he got the gold mining equipment right that's how i see it mm-hmm. and that gold mining uh, map and the, the methodology and the, the, the uh, can be used 
to access the wisdom of all mythologies and all cultures. So that's the big gift of Jung. And he could not have developed that if he had strayed too much and got too seduced by other mythologies. He stayed true to his own tradition, but used that as a kind of a his ground. Mm -hmm. So I think each one of us, and I, I do believe that each one of us must stay true to our ground. Mm -hmm. But from that ground, so if you are a, a Christian, if you're Catholic, you must stick close to your tradition. Mm -hmm. But study one, at least one other tradition different than yours yeah. to give you, to give one uh, the a three dimensional view, number one, because God gave us two eyes for a reason or two ears. Uh, if he had just one ear, it'll be a nice big eye like Cyclops, but we will not get the three dimensional view. Mm. And we will not have a backup eye if one dies. <laughs> so I think there is a wisdom in, in, uh, in creation. Uh, and I think to study one other culture gives us a, a, a nuanced view of our own situation. And it also attends to the blind spots in every culture. Because mm. each culture hyper trophies in a certain perspective of the mythological universe. Yeah. But what we don't attend to goes in the shadow. But if we claim that shadow and honor it by studying at least one other tradition, yeah, you could be Buddhism, but not to convert to it, just to study it, yeah, and use it as a as a frame of reference in, to the in, process. In my language, you know, when when I first went to India, I was twenty one, and I would think I was yes. saying just before we started that to see people making offerings to the goddesses and gods, uh, it it's like a an enantiodromia, however you say that word, isn't it? It's like yes. Yes. You, you, you've been brought up in one way in the soil of secular materialism or something, and maybe one is a little aware that there's some spirituality missing in that somehow, right. unconsciously perhaps. And then one goes to India. But I, I've seen two things happen to a lot of young people that went to India. One is a tremendous healing just through spiritual experience. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, you know, a flourishing uh, yeah. and, and perhaps going up the mountain a little into the spirit, you know. Mm -hmm. But another is the craziness of the spirit, that for some people that when, you, you know, I can understand what you were talking about, that, and Jung also said to have your feet on the ground, like I often get the image of Uluru as the centre of the Australian mm -hmm. myth in a way, the rock, mm -hmm. the, the yes. solid earth that, of my soil, if you want to put it that way. But it's kind of like there's some craziness in the spirit if the foot, if the foot is not on the ground. So, so it's a wonderful thing to go to another culture, but not if you just go totally over on the other side. And right. the way we witness that on occasions is that you'd see the Western people in the kurta and pyjama and uh, burning more incense than an Indian person's ever thought of burning. You know, right. it's kind of like... Just going well, way uh, over and adopting the clothing, the mannerisms. Exactly. Well, it becomes a little bit of a karma kola experience, you know. Uh, the, there's a popular term in India. It's karma kola. People who want like a Coca-Cola spirituality, you know. <laughs> you can <live. laughs> uh, But as you know, Young went to India. He was invited by the the British government in 1937-38. He went for three months. Uh, he got three doctorates there uh, at the Benares Hindu University, the uh, Calcutta Christian University, why, uh, and, and of course the uh, the Allahabad Muslim University. And during those three months, he traveled throughout India with his companion, the Rockefeller family fellow. And they went all the way, all around. And um, and he had a lot of impressions about India, which uh, you know I, I discuss in my various books and, and writings and, and tours. Uh, but he took a book with him on alchemy mm. because he was afraid to get too ungrounded by, as you described, the Indian experience mm. of a raw spirituality. You see the face of God. You see your cosmic self when you, if you yield to it. And that is a, a overwhelming experience. It's the what auto, <coughs> uh, you know, we, uh, we Mist said the experience, the Mist holy is like a mysterium. Tremendum. 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 It is like it's mysterium, it's numinous, but it's also like, wow, I've seen nuclear explosion and it can destroy me. So so that is a problem for people. And that is because you suddenly 
are thrust into an archetypal realm. People live by the archetypes. In Indians don't live by neocortical consciousness. They live by limbic consciousness in the day-to-day -day life. So mm -hmm. I have friends who are nuclear physicists. My brother is one. He's a nuclear scientist. And in their day life, they are you know very logical, but they live their personal life in the archetypal realm, informed by the stories of their grandmothers and, and the old ancient myths of India. And they do a beautiful job of integrating the two. So that's a, a challenge. Uh, and that uh, uninitiated Westerner, well-meaning, but uninitiated, is not privy to. And I think that's the challenge. In, in Jungian language, there's a huge work of integration. Uh, like I, I might say, it's a tremendous opening to go to, yes. go to India. Um, and, you know, as you've described it, but the work of integration is a, is a, is a slow and patient pro, uh, process. No, and you must take India in small doses. That's why I take a study tour to India every year for the last 20 years now. Uh, uh, and we go to same sites as Jung did, and we explore his ideas, come up with our own ideas, our own alchemic hermeneutics, as we were talking about. Uh, and uh, But one thing I always do is to ensure that everyone who comes there stays grounded in their own framework and their own tradition. So there was a, uh, once we had a, a Jewish uh, lady who come, came with us who had lost connection with her Jewish tradition. She goes, ah, it's all nonsense. Uh, and, uh, and then she had these profound experiences in India of Hindu spirituality and she was overwhelmed and crying. And, and I, I you know, met with her in, uh, a few times. And at the end of two weeks, she became solidly grounded in her Jewish tradition again yeah. because she's got a glimpse of her own tradition when yeah. that opening happened. Mm. And uh, we still keep in touch and she is totally connected to that process, and, uh, and, her, her own process. And can I mention one other thing around that, Ashok? Sure. Is, um, I think for maybe perhaps a lot of young Western people, there was the thought that there wasn't a... If, if you weren't Christian-oriented... Uh, that there was a thought that there's there's not a spirituality in the West. And, you know, so much lately, through Jung and through speaking with others, Thomas More, you know, for example, mm -hmm. that this spiritual tradition in the Renaissance, or, uh, uh, the, 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 the Platonism, the Neoplatonism, that it's just that the spiritual tradition went off uh, went a little underground, I would say, and yes. and um, you know we went down the rationalist path. But it seems to me that it's very important for a Western person to go back, and even I think Peter Kingsley with Catafalque, you know, when he talks about the pre-Socratic philosophers that incubated their dreams in caves, and how even ration rationality and logic kind of came from a dream. That it's important to kind of. Uh, for many to realize that there is a spiritual tradition in the West apart from Christianity. Well, not only is there a spiritual tradition in the West, but I think we have a, uh, in some ways, a more robust spiritual tradition in the West than in the East even for now. Really? Because in East there is an enteodromia. We have returned to the opposite from deep spirituality to a extreme materiality and, uh, and so forth. So I think while in the West, what I've found is people who have enough material kind of resources and they that does not do the trick and they are returning to a deep spiritual foundation. Uh, they don't have a language for it, I think, unfortunately, mm. and religion does not do it for them, but they have a deep sense of uh, spirituality and uh, it is uh, awe-inspiring to me as a young analyst to see that and to reintroduce them to their own spiritual emanation because they don't know that they are uh, deeply spiritual they don't have a language for it but they're living it and i think all you know good analysts would do is to give them a mirror to look what you're doing is deeply spiritual mm. uh, and, and they just don't know it so when, when a uh, young man in milwaukee or chicago takes their son to a baseball game it's like taking them to a church it's a communitas, there is a fellowship, there is a ritual, there is a, a sort of almost like Eucharistic thing, having a beer or a Coca-Cola for the father, uh, for the son and beer. For <laughs> Not the, for the father. 
<laughs> it's almost a Eucharistic experience of the grace of you know the, the playfulness and the joyfulness, and yeah. and it becomes a sacred ritual. We don't don't have you know a, a spiritual frame on it, but it is a spiritual experience, mm. uh, and then you know the, then you can deepen it and honor it. I mean, what a beautiful image taking your. 12, 10 year old son to a, a baseball game or a cricket or wherever yeah. and kind of spending an afternoon together and, and you know out. you know sometimes in Australia there's Australian rules football which is very big right and, and I remember <laughs> my family had membership tickets etc and I went to a game and, and you know my mother was getting on then she was about 70 or nearly 80 actually Yes. And there, there were a lot of her friends, you know, and they're all in the twin piece suits and that. And then as soon as the game started, it's like they went crazy, you know. It's like they're yelling at the umpire and things. And I was thinking, this is like a Dionysian festival, you know. It's like yes. what happens is it comes out for two hours. Because before the game starts, they say, would you like a cup of tea, dear? You know, they're very nice <laughs> a lot. And then the game starts, they're yelling, at, everything's gone, all of the energy's merged. But... As soon as the game finishes, it goes back. So it's kind of like our little escape yeah. role or something like that. Yeah, so is that they go into a state of reverie in the West. And we the similar phenomenon happens in the East. It's religious gatherings. In religious gatherings, you know, people Ecstatic. go into this uh, state of ecstasy and, you know, Dionysian frenzy. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of my videos of some of my trips. And, you know, this is uh, this whole process in South India of what's called Thayer dance when... Your body is possessed by an ancestral spirit and communicates to you. It's a beautiful ceremony, actually, uh, and and that's same as a you know being possessed by the energy uh, of the, of the game in in the West. So I think we have different rituals which are which have a spiritual kind of context, mm -hmm. uh, but we just don't call it that. The language, uh, yeah, and, and I mean I know we're getting perhaps closer to our time, Ashok, but it's kind of like. It seems to me that one of the great gifts of Jung was to bring in a language uh, into yes. the West. But I'm wondering in your own integration, you know, I'd like to get back to if you take from your limbic brain, you know, your, from your ancestral wisdom and learnings, how, what are you bringing to this idea of individuation, of the journey, of how would you describe it now? Well, the way I would describe it is, uh, and in all you know, respect for my guru, Young, uh, Young gives us beautiful tools for individuation to become the, you know, Uber John or Uber Ashok, the best version of you or me. Young will help you get there. So you got to that what Nietzsche called the Uber Mensch, the Uber, the highest. But, you know, the best version of John that can be. Mm. But now the problem is, when you are the best version of John and I'm the best version of me, Ashok, we are all dressed up and nowhere to go. And that is where India comes in. That is India's enduring contribution to human consciousness, is to take a, a refined version, a higher version of you, and put it into play to do your dharmic duty, which is four layers of dharma, for example. You know, first cultivate your personal best potential, swadharma. Then use those potential potential in service of your family, ashram dharma. Having retired that, then move to serving your community of, you know, that chooses you to serve it, not what you choose to serve. Uh, that is your varna dharma, your varna, your communitas. But when you have even done that, when we are closer to the you know the dusk of life, uh, then the highest dharma is rita dharma, your responsibility, your dharma to the collective, even to the environment, and to higher consciousness. And when you feel merged with it, you then become a portal to connectivity with the rest of the world because each one of us who reaches that level of consciousness, uh, become sort of a diamond in Indra's net. Nest. It is a net in the universe. Uh, this in Atharva Veda, he says that each refined soul is a diamond in Indra's net, and each soul 
is when it becomes diamond reflects all of the diamonds and we see that we are all part of the same matrix, the unity of consciousness. So that becomes respect for the animals, respect for the environment, respect for each other, a Hindu and a Muslim and a Christian and a Jew. We are reflections of each other. The inter becomes, interrelatedness to use the... Interrelatedness, and that is Unas Mundus. That is Brahman consciousness. That is the soup we are in all together. Yeah. Uh, and then we have respect for that universality of human condition. That is India's biggest contribution to it, the human condition and human seems, understanding. It seems to me, so one thing I got from being in India is that the, this intricate knowledge detailed knowledge and there's so many uh, there's so many writings really isn't it yes and but handed down through the centuries which is which is you know there's so much language for these kinds of things yes. and there's so much uh portals in and, and there's so many ways to understand it yeah, yeah. and so many ways to guide us uh, even stories yeah. that are controversial guide us. I mean, one of the most controversial stories in the, uh, you know, Bhagavata Purana uh, and its 40,000 40, verses is the uh, story about Krishna and gopis. You know, Krishna, when he was a young man, uh, a teenager, all the women in the town, even the married ones, loved him. So they would go and seek him out. Uh, and uh, and he would connect with them, and they had some, you know, uh, the idea is that uh, at that time dancing, there were 16,000. Is dancing, dancing with each one of them individually, 16,000 of them. Right. And that was the reason this Bhagavata Purana was banned in, in, uh, in England and in all over the places. They had a court that this is a blasphemous pornographic stuff because it was not understood. And I have analyzed it, discussed it with Jungian groups, and here is my own alchemic hermeneutics about that story. And, the, and after that uh, affair with these 16,000 women, he advises them to be good wives and go back to their husbands. So they're on top of that. There's a paradox. Yeah. And here is a, the alchemic gold of that story. That in those days, like now, men were misogynistic. They you know, disrespected their women. They treated them like their property. And the story reminds them that each woman is essentially a bride of the God. And you only have access to that soul in this lifetime if you are going to conduct yourself with that God-likeness, with that high respect for the feminine. Uh, and never forget that your bride is not your bride. Your bride is the bride of God. And you are only blessed to have access to that soul in this one lifetime. So always treat her like a bride of God. And when we have that kind of respect for the feminine, that it changes the dynamic. Yeah. So I think that was the mo intended moral of that story mm. is uh, that is true because every person, every man, every woman is essentially a child of the divine. Mm. And when we treat our partner or friend or even our adversary as anything but a child of the divine of the god or a spouse of uh, of it or you know we are going against the conduct of the of the god god's guidance so or universe's guidance uh, i don't mean religious god i mean the you know the the spiritual dimension of it so i i think each story has a, a guidance uh, for each one of us and there yeah. are billions of stories in india one for yeah. every purpose and i think yeah. that's the gift of that great culture it has a storehouse of archetypal wisdom, uh, some yet not even translated in uh, even in Indian languages, let alone in English mm. or any European language. And there's a lot of projects there. Uh, Banaras Hindu University is translating that in consort with the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies and so forth. So we are we're uncovering these beautiful stories all the time, and it will continue to guide us for thousands of years to come. That's lovely, Ashok. That might be a good place to finish. I just want to say one thing that from my sure. interpretation of having spent that little time in India is that Krishna was a bit of a trickster figure too. You know, if you want to yep. <laughs> kind of compare him back to the um, the Greek pantheon. Right. And, he was a hermetic figure, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I just wondered before we go, could you just tell us a little bit about the tours you take? Because I think there could be a lot of people that, you know, maybe in, I'm going to put your, um, to your website at the link on. Uh, yes, yes. I think out. it's, uh, uh, we we have called the annual uh, study group that we took to take to India. It's uh, It used to be called in footsteps of Carl Jung in India, but now we sometimes go off that track, but still essentially a similar track. And we explore the rich, archetypal traditions of India uh, from a Jungian and also from an Eastern and a neuroscientific perspective. And we have a small group with between 15 to 20 max. And uh, and we travel to different sections of India each year. This year we are in this February, we're going to Rajasthan uh, to find uh, you know, a Jungian lens of the uh, archetypal soul of India in its desert, because desert is a place where the soul manifests in a unique manner in his red book, Jung encountered the desert. Yeah. He's, he's encounter, he encounters the the uh, the red one, you know, the the Dionysian soul. He encountered the anchorite, the Philemon soul, in the desert. So if you go to desert, each one of us must take a retreat in the desert wherever you are, whether you are in Western Australia or. It's all India. desert here. We're lucky. We've got a lot of desert. <laughs> and the desert, the soul of a nation, the soul of a culture speaks the loudest because there are few distractions and you are face to face with your limbic consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have anything real, your your psyche creates images that will guide you. That is why Jung went to a desert in his, in, uh, in his red book often to, to get the deepest wisdom. So that's our tour this year, uh, and uh, we are also hoping to catch a World Sufi Festival. We are trying to overlap with that, and the dates are fixed, and we are trying to make sure that the we world can what? catch World Sufi the Festival. World Sufi Festival. Oh, I thought you said the World so, Surfing Festival, and I was going to say Sufi, Sufi, the <laughs> Sufi tradition, because Young did a beautiful uh, Eros conference on the Sufi tradition. Mm. Uh, in 1939, just before World War II, and he chose it because it is the rebirth mystery, how an individual and a nation or a culture is reborn after destruction. Yeah. Uh, and very, I think we are in very, a, very important for this time with so much. Uh, we are in the same place now. Darkness and the need for this rebirth. Right. Very important collectively. Right. And that was the, his discussion was on the 18th surah of Quran, the people of the cave. And uh, and how, you know, after death, you're reborn into a new consciousness, which is what happens in our psyche all the time. The old self must die and new phoenix, a new self emerges. That's the individuation process. And that happens best in a desert. So that's why we're chosen the desert theme this year. That sounds wonderful. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for talking to us. Of course, thank you, John. I enjoyed our dialogue. <laughs> thank you.